It's the first time I've ever done an interview on Zoom, and uh, hopefully this will be the way we're doing them from now on, so you'll have to excuse my background. Uh, our guest today uh, is somebody who I have been learning from, gosh, since 20, gosh, actually 2009, 2010, reading one of his books that he wrote with uh, uh, James Turk, and then, of course, his website at dollarcollapse.com. Uh, one of the best websites you can go to for good factual information, research articles, not just his own writing, many other works as well. Um, he's been at it for a long time. He's a very smart economist, uh, John Rubino. John, thanks for joining us. Hey, Daniel. It's great to see you again. It's been a while. John, um, can you give us an update on the website? It's probably been at least a year since the last time we've done an interview any changes with the website? Any uh, uh, specific focus you have on right now for uh, dollarclaps.com? Uh, do dollarclaps.com is, is pretty much what it has been for the past decade. It's just a you know, continuously updated site that covers the, uh, the evolving global financial crisis, um, so we, which means it's, you know, it's getting more interesting as things get crazier out there because they, they really are getting crazy. You know, you know, hopefully we'll have time to talk about some of the really egregious things that are being done uh, financially by the central banks of the world and the governments of the world and the consequences that uh, are pretty much inevitable at this point. You know, since, since you started uh, forecasting for a potential dollar collapse or perhaps the inevitable collapse, but you never really said it's imminent, uh, you have seen the financial crisis evolve, but kind of a curveball in, the, in here is money also evolving. Because the uh, confidence and the you know faith in in the fiat currency system has gone a lot further than I thought it could have gone. Uh, we're seeing all sorts of crazy deficits from the U.S. from China. Nobody cares. The, the market has no rejection of the the certain level of insanity that we have right now. Uh, you look at the U.S. Treasury yields. I mean, things are. You know, it's, it's kind of shocking uh, as far as it's gone on. So are we seeing an evolution of money uh, for the bad or for, for the good? Well, first of all, yeah, I didn't think it could go this long either. You know, to, to get to the place where the numbers are what they are now seemed inconceivable a decade ago. Uh, and yet here we are. The, the world has not yet lost faith in fiat currencies, even though, you know, the amount of credit in the world... Um, ha has literally doubled in the past decade from levels that were already um, literally double what they were 10 years before that. And so we're in completely uncharted territory right now. Um, one of the, the interesting things that we've seen happen lately is the rise of cryptocurrencies. You know, you, you can say if, if the price of copper goes up or steel or real estate or whatever, that's not necessarily a direct vote of no confidence in the dollar and the euro and the yen, you know, but with new currencies arising, like with, with Bitcoin and the other cryptos, uh, that is people making the decision to swap their fiat currencies into non-fiat currencies. So it's a direct vote of no confidence in the world's um, government-run currencies. So that, that's an interesting transition that we're in now. And sure. It, it could be a big deal going forward. Yeah, I mean, it, it, have you personally used Bitcoin for any transactions or cryptocurrencies for any transactions? I have not. I had a chance to buy Bitcoin way back when, when a, you know, a good friend was trying to talk me into it, and I decided not to because I didn't understand it and wish I had. You know, But uh, I, I love the concept of private sector currency, that it is not run by any government, and operates outside the traditional banking system. You know, that's, that is a libertarian fantasy that's happening right now. But, um, but I, I won't pretend to know how this plays out. You know, there are a lot of moving parts to the cryptocurrency story. And where it goes from here depends on a lot of things that haven't yet happened. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm watching it with interest, but not participating in any meaningful way. Do you think it's a competitor to gold or an ally of gold? Uh, probably both. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a competitor in the sense that uh, the people who are losing faith in fiat currencies, who traditionally buy gold, now have a chance to buy these other currencies. And a lot of people are, you know, cryptocurrencies have gone up dramatically relative to, to precious metals. Um, on the other hand, 
to the extent that there are huge embedded profits in cryptocurrencies. That's good for gold because, you know, if you bought Bitcoin at 50 bucks and now it's 10,000, um, you're thinking, all right, I want to ride this more because I'm, you know, I'm loving the upward arc of this asset that I bought, but I also want to protect some of those gains. And so you, you probably aren't going to just go right back into fiat currencies by selling Bitcoin um, and just stick with dollars and euros and yen or whatever, you know, whatever your host country currency is, because you don't trust that currency. Sure. Uh, and gold is the thing that you would logically buy to protect the gains that you make in cryptocurrencies to the extent that, so to the extent that cryptocurrencies just explode, you know, if that market gets bigger and bigger, then um, some of the profits that are generated by that process ought to be siphoned off into precious metals. So it's, it's sort of a way station between fiat currencies and precious metals. And, and you know, I think gold is, is really the end point of our monetary evolution. We're going to go back, to the, uh, the physical money that governments can't create in unlimited quantities. And we're gonna base tomorrow's monetary system on gold and to a lesser extent silver. Um, cryptocurrencies might end up being the transaction mechanism. In other mm. words, we use the blockchain to trade ownership of gold and silver um, a as a way of, um, making those things liquid, which they're not now. And I, I, so, so I think that's in the coming decade, we'll evolve in that direction probably. And I think that's good for cryptocurrencies and great for precious metals. Sure, okay, so you know, that's, it's really difficult to predict what will be the currency that replaces the dollar. And, and you've said that before. You, it's, we're, we're in an unprecedented situation where the entire world is on this fiat-based experiment. So, Looking at 2018, U.S. stock market, President has married his success to the stock market, which seems like a suicidal move. Uh, and then you've also got the economy picking up in many parts because of the tax cuts. People have more money, so they're spending more. A lot of optimism throughout the economy. I'm sure you've seen the numbers. Many small business numbers or consumer numbers are at highs or multi-decade highs. So with that said, um, do you think uh, this thing is all going to implode on uh, President Trump before his term's over or have the rolling back of regulations and the tax cuts bought himself another four or five years of this? Uh, I, I, you know what? You could have asked me this question anytime in the last decade and I would have said it implodes sooner rather than later, you know, just because the numbers are so outrageous. What we've done now, what, what the Trump administration has done now is, you know, seven or eight years into an expansion, they've turbocharged fiscal stimulus. In other words, they cut taxes and they're ramping up defense spending and infrastructure spending and, and borrowing money to do it. Um, at a time when that's not normally what governments do. Usually, you know, eight years into an expansion, governments are basically in, um, in surplus almost, it's just because lots of people are at work and uh, their corporate, or, uh, corporate taxes are, are generating lots of revenue for governments and capital gains taxes are flowing in. And, and so governments are flush. But what we're doing is we're gonna um, run trillion dollar deficits for as far as the eye can see starting now. Um, and the other governments of the world are kind of sort of doing the same thing. China's debt is exploding and Japan's debt is exploding. Um, and the idea that this can go on indefinitely is absurd. You know, we, we um, should have been reining back our borrowing and instead we're ramping it up. Now that, uh, that'll buy you a little bit of time under normal circumstances because you know if it's the bottom of a recession yeah fiscal stimulus is good or at least useful but now i think it's playing with fire it's an extremely dangerous thing to do because um, the, the amount of debt that we're creating now is already pushing up interest rates and we've taken on so much debt in the last 30 years that we're, we're really vulnerable to rising interest rates because everybody has to roll their debts over or their debts are attached to an index in some way, so they go up directly with interest rates. So let interest rates go up in the next six months the way they've gone up in the last six months, and that alone will blow up the budgets of most governments. 
and a lot of individuals and many corporations, you know, because if, if your interest costs double and you are already highly leveraged to begin with, you're really vulnerable to that. And that's where the world is now. You know, in, in uh, The Money Bubble, a book I co-wrote with James Turk a few years back, we have a chapter called The Variable Rate World about how um, everybody is vulnerable to higher interest rates now because we've all basically attached ourselves to these very low rates. You know, governments have borrowed short term um, in order to get zero or negative rates. But when rates stop being zero and stop being negative and start going up into positive territory, they got to roll that debt over. And it's now several trillion dollars a year worldwide that have to be rolled over every year at higher and higher rates. So this is a time bomb yeah. that we build into the system. So um, uh, everybody, I'm talking to uh, John Rubino of dollarclaps.com. Uh, one of his recent articles is on pensions. And you've been following this more than anybody for a long time. I think a few of your articles have been picked up by Zero Hedge. Uh, tell us about what's going on with the pensions because – that is one of the bubbles out there that I've heard many people talk about. I've read many of your articles, um, and it's, it's, it's amazing. With this recent small pullback, all of a sudden it came right back into the news again. So are we looking at a pension crisis unfolding over the next year to two years? Yeah, that's, that's one of the crises we're looking at. Uh, the, the backstory of pensions is that um, 20 or 30 years ago, uh, the people running states and cities, along with the, uh, the heads of the public sector unions, got together and decided that, uh, you know, they, they can't have massive wage increases because that's, that's public. You know, that's, that's embarrassing for all concerned. But they can have really generous pension plans that nobody understands and, and that don't really cost you anything in the short run. You know, you only have to pay off on these pension plans when the baby boomers start to retire. So they set up these deals, got away with it for several decades, retired, rich, and happy. And now we're paying the price for their mismanagement. Baby boomers are retiring, and state and local pension plans don't have anything like the kind of money that they need to cover um, the, the health care and retirement costs of my generation. You know? and, and so they're, they're all dropping more and more deeply into underfunding, which is a, a prelude to bankruptcy. And that's with stock market going up. <laughs> you know, when the stock market turns back down, when we have the inevitable bear market, that's going to eviscerate these pension plans. So you're going to see Chicago, they're already functionally bankrupt, but you'll see them go de facto, you know, de jure bankrupt. You know, they'll, they'll have to do it in some legal way where they default on their pension obligations. Same thing with the entire state of Illinois. Same thing with many, many other states and cities. Um, that, so that could be the catalyst that tips us over from being optimistic, you know, and, and willing to borrow mm. to being terrified and desperate to save, uh, which is the same thing as saying, you know, a 1930s style depression. You know, that, that's what the pension system blowing up could give us. And the numbers keep getting worse and worse. So it's, it's fairly clear that we don't have a lot of time left to fix the pension plans of the world, and we can't fix them. You know, there, there's no legal way to cut benefits on a scale that they gotta do to make the numbers work, or to raise taxes in a politically acceptable way to make the numbers work. You can't make these numbers work without, um, without blowing up some aspect of your constituency out there. Uh, if you're a politician. So they're going to just let it go off a cliff, apparently. And, you know, that might be the thing that blows up the system. There are a lot of other things that, that could happen first, but pensions are clearly, a, a, you know, something waiting to come back to bite us and probably in the not too distant future, you know, a few years at least, or the next bear market. You know, that, that could happen in the next three months. And then we'll have headlines about pension funds blowing up pretty much everywhere. Uh, John, you're, you're a very smart economist and journalist, and I want to ask you this because I know you're not, you know, you're very open-minded when, when I've spoken to you in the past. So I'm going to throw this question at you. It's probably the perfect question, but I don't know if you get asked this a lot. What do you see? I mean, you see the whole thing. You're seeing the big picture, the bonds and the economy and, and, and everything that's happening with uh, the, the commodities. Um, what if anything has you optimistic that we can get through this time and we'll have a better economy or a better world in say 15 years? Is it 
are, do you see any technologies out there? Like a lot of libertarians think it's going to be the cryptocurrencies. Do you see anything out there that has you a little bit optimistic that, hey, you know what? If we can just hold this together for five more years, 10 more years, I think we can come out of the other side with a, with a better world. Well, finance and technology are two different um, questions. On the financial side, with the, you know, it's baked in the cake. We have a gigantic crisis. There's no way to make the numbers work. And, uh, and so we have to somehow get rid of a lot of the debt that we've taken on. You can only do that in two ways, basically. You, uh, um, you default on most of your debt and have a 1930s-style depression, or you inflate it away and have a, a Weimar Germany kind of hyperinflation. You know, we, we've got one of those two things coming, and it's not clear which. Uh, now, on the optimistic side, there are amazing technologies out there that are, are changing the world in really positive ways. Solar power is going to completely replace coal in the not-too-distant future. And uh, electric cars, whether they're run by fuel cells or by batteries, that's, that's not clear yet. But they're going to replace internal combustion engines pretty soon with very positive effects um, on many aspects of the, uh, you know, the global economy and the global financial system. But that's, that doesn't stop the crisis that flows from all the debt that we've got coming. You know, that, that's going to come, and the only question is timing with that, whether it's this year or five years from now, a gigantic financial crisis is out there and absolutely necessary. You know, you can't take on a lot of debt without having a, a crisis of commensurate size to get rid of that debt. You know, it's like, um, you know, the way we mismanaged our forests in the U.S. for such a long time. We stamped out all fires and the forests accumulated so much underbrush that now when there's a fire, it's hotter than it should be and it's incredibly destructive and there's no way to get, um, get past that except to let it all burn and then start over. Well, the economy is the same thing. You know, we've got to let it burn. We've got to let the debt be wiped out one way or another and then go back to sound money and then start from a sustainable position going forward. Um, however, at the bottom of the next crash, there are gonna be some amazing tech growth stocks to pick up. And in fact, the book that I'm supposed to be working on now <laughs> is tentatively titled After the Crash. And it's about all these technologies, you know. It, it, um, when the time comes, there's going to be, you know, regenerative medicine companies and alternative energy and, and new agriculture business models that are so much better than what's existing today that, uh, that, that, that they'll become growth stocks. You know, all of that's going to be out there. And it, they'll just be ripe for the picking because everybody's going to be terrified of, um, of the equity markets. Um, but... We still have to get to the point where everybody's terrified of equities. You know, we have to have that crash. And, and so that should be the, the big thing that people are paying attention to now is how to protect yourself from this tsunami of crises that are heading our way. And in that way, have the capital at the bottom to, to turn optimistic and start buying all these fascinating companies with huge growth, prospect, growth prospects. Um, and how do you do that? You know, that, that's the intellectual challenge of our time, really. And one way to do it is uh, to look at history and see that financial crises have come and gone throughout um, human history since there were markets originally. You know, go back 3,000 years, there have been financial crises up until today. Mm -hmm. uh, gold and silver have done well in virtually all of them because that's where people hide when the money that governments create and then destroy um, ceases to function. You know, we, we go back to gold and silver, the local currency price of those things go through the roof, and the people who hold precious metals end up having the capital to start over. You know, and that, that, so that's probably something that, uh, that is easy and understandable for a person to do, and it's probably the best thing you can do financially. You know, and, and right after that is pay off debts. You know, get out mm -hmm. of debt as quickly as possible. And in that way, protect yourself from an interruption of cash flow. You know, you, you should only borrow money if you're guaranteed to be able to pay it off. Uh, most people aren't guaranteed to be able to pay off their, their debts right now. So they should be looking at um, paying them off in the short run and in that way, protecting themselves from the impact of, you know, a leaky roof or a lost job or an illness or any of the number of things that can interrupt your income 
um, and can destroy the life of somebody who's, uh, who, who's too highly leveraged, you know, who's too deeply in debt. Uh, do those two things and you're, you're halfway to being completely protected from what comes. That's very good advice. All right, I uh, hope to have you on the show much sooner, hopefully in the next month or two, again, for an update. Okay. Uh, John Rubino, uh, dollarcollapse.com, everybody. It's a great website. He gives us uh, articles uh, free, as well as uh, some of the favorite news stories that he finds uh, throughout the internet. Uh, John, thanks again for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Dan.